questions. I recognize the Leader of the Opposition. We've heard a lot of concern about staffing levels in seniors care facilities. And we've heard how chronic short staffing is negatively affecting the quality of care that seniors in Saskatchewan receive. We've heard stories, Mr. Speaker, of seniors being forced to wake up at 5 in the morning. Of seniors, Mr. Speaker, being forced to soil themselves because there's no one there to help them to the bathroom. We've heard of some seniors not even receiving a weekly bath. Two-thirds of seniors' care facilities in the province have staffing vacancies. And the urgent business cases that were put forward by care facilities show a desperate need for new staff. But this government, Mr. Speaker, isn't even addressing and filling the current vacancies. My question to the Premier, Mr. Speaker, why not? Yeah. Hey, Mr. Speaker, some quotes from the state of, about the state of care. The staffing levels are deplorable. Need more people to answer buzzers. Average wait time is 40 minutes. Someone actually timed it. Residents notice staff shortages and often have to wait up to 30 minutes after they ring their call bell. Continent residents have soiled themselves because of it. Residents don't get their teeth cleaned regularly. Shaving is rushed, causing neck rash. Only bath once per week. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Has he heard enough? Has he heard enough to admit that it was a mistake to remove any sort of reference to adequate staffing, staffing from the seniors' care regulations? At the start of this spring session, I brought forward the NDP private member's bill, the Residents in Care Bill of Rights Act, which would be an important step to start fixing the basics in seniors' care facilities. This government removed minimum care standards from the regulations, and the guidelines that this government has for seniors' care facilities clearly are not working. We hear repeated examples of that, Mr. Speaker. This government's own Law Reform Commission recommended a legislated Bill of Rights for seniors' care facilities. Here, here. To the Minister, why is this government ignoring the advice of its own Law Reform Commission and refusing to take the important step to improve seniors' care in our province? The shortage of affordable housing in communities across the province is a major problem. And the government's new social housing policies are making it worse. Because of the new age requirements for tenants, the Earl Grey Housing Authority recently had a one-bedroom unit sit vacant for close to six months, despite having numerous calls from people desperately looking for a place to rent. And because of the new community market rent policy, the Earl Grey Housing Authority must charge $800 per month. They say that is, and I quote, far too high for our small village, end of quote. To the Minister, why is this government, as a landlord, making it so hard for people to rent social housing units at affordable rates? Last week, the federal government's hasty amendments to the legislation on the green transportation crisis were ruled out of order. And this botched bill is just the latest in a series of many blunders that have characterized the federal government's handling of this green transportation catastrophe. Instead of demanding urgent action and putting pressure on the federal government to deliver last March, our provincial government has been applauding the feds and patting Jerry Ritz on the back every step of the way. To the Mr. Speaker, it's so clear this government has no influence on the feds, even though come election time, they're out there pounding in signs for them. When will this minister put aside his own partisan support of the federal conservatives and properly represent the producers of Saskatchewan? Yeah, yeah. We've been calling on this government to develop and implement a comprehensive anti-poverty strategy. There have been many calls for this over the years, Mr. Speaker, from many different groups and organization, organizations, and today the Children's Advocate has joined that call. He says that Saskatchewan needs a comprehensive anti-poverty strategy. Mr. Speaker, the opposition would be very pleased to work with the government to make that a reality. My question is for the Premier. Will he agree that Saskatchewan would benefit from a comprehensive anti-poverty strategy? 16% of non-Aboriginal children in our province live in poverty. That's incredibly shocking and bad, Mr. Speaker, but it gets worse. 30% of Métis and non-status First Nations children in our province live in poverty, and 64% of First Nations children in Saskatchewan are living in poverty. We are failing miserably, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to giving Saskatchewan children the very best start in life. And they can heckle all they want, Mr. Speaker, but they need to listen to the children's advocate. Again, to the Premier, what will it take for him to realize and for his government to realize that Saskatchewan needs a comprehensive anti-poverty strategy? 
Mr. Speaker, I don't know why the minister in this government is so dismissive of what the children's advocate is saying. We know that the human cost of poverty is massive, Mr. Speaker, and that ought to be enough to convince this government that a comprehensive anti-poverty strategy is needed, especially when we're talking about vulnerable children. But, Mr. Speaker, we know that poverty also costs government and costs society a tremendous amount, a lot of money, Mr. Speaker. Estimates say poverty costs Saskatchewan $420 million in higher health costs, $720 million in increased social assistance, up to $120 million in increased criminal justice costs and billions and billions in lost economic opportunity. Yet Saskatchewan, Mr. Speaker, is one of only two provinces that does not have a comprehensive poverty reduction strategy. My question to the Premier, why is he being so stubborn on this issue? Mr. Speaker, the Children's Advocate released his annual report today and it shows that Child and Family Services is facing an appalling shortage of staff and resources. And as in previous years, the advocate says that caseworkers are overworked with far too many cases and unable to properly look out for vulnerable children. In just the last four years, 81 vulnerable children have died. These were children who were in the care of, the so of social services or who had just left the system. And those deaths don't, in don't include the deaths of natural causes. The children's advocate talks about two tragic deaths of very young children, and he notes that the workers for these children had caseloads in excess of 40 vulnerable children. He says, and I quote, the, this caseload pressure critically impacted the quality of their work and their ability to comply with standards in policy, end of quote. That's why the children's advocate is calling for manageable caseloads for child, child protection workers. To the minister, will she commit to reverse her cuts to child and family services and implement the recommendation today. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, many residents, businesses and communities east of Regina have been justifiably raising the alarm about unsafe travel conditions on Highway No. 1, and representatives of those communities have joined us here today. While yesterday's bypass announcement is certainly welcome, completion of it four years down the line doesn't make travelling east of Regina any safer right now today. And that's what local residents and businesses in the area, young people and family, need from this government. They need action to improve safety today. To the minister, is he listening? Yeah. The Canadian Cancer Society is pushing for a ban on youth tanning. The Saskatchewan Medical Association has passed a resolution supporting such a ban. The Canadian Medical Association supports it, and so does the World Health Organization. To the Minister, how can he stubbornly dismiss the advice of such highly regarded organizations? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, experts recommend it. Most other provinces have done it, but for some reason, this government refuses to ban youth tanning, and their excuses for inaction do not make any sense. A ban on youth tanning would significantly reduce the incidence of skin cancer and save lives, and this government knows that. The government wants to contract out food services in corrections and youth custody. It will affect 60 or more staff who will lose their jobs in the province's corrections and youth custody facilities. In many of these facilities, food service workers assist with rehabilitation. The government is using this report to justify their privatization agenda, but they won't release it or any part of it. If this report is so compelling that the province has decided to privatize these jobs, why is it afraid to release this report? But Joan Newfeld has been a nurse in Saskatoon for 42 years. She's seen many trends come and go, and she's still working in the healthcare system. And she's not afraid to speak out about the latest flavor of the month, because she has never seen, Mr. Speaker, a pet project that is as ridiculous, as wasteful, and as, ex ex as expensive as this government's obsession with lean. Okay. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, will he listen to Joan Newfeld's common sense, or Will he continue to dismiss the concerns from frontline health care workers? Here, here. Joan Newfeld has been through the Kaizen Basics training. She's been in the Health Quality Council additional programming, Mr. Speaker. But she has definitely not drunk the lean Kaizen Kool-Aid like this government has chugged it, Mr. Speaker. Right. She thinks the government has allowed the lean process to become a cash cow for the U.S. consultants, for the Japanese senseis, Mr. Speaker, while ignoring ignoring the needs on the front lines. She's speaking out and she's demanding better for patients and demanding better for residents in care facilities. Nope. And the vast majority of nurses 
and health care workers, Mr. Speaker, agree with her. My question to the Premier, when will he start listening to the concerns from the front lines? When will he admit that he's gone way overboard with his lean obsession? When will he finally cancel the fat cash cow contract and put the focus on the front lines in the hospitals and the care facilities where it's needed? Here, here. The, the Premier keeps parody in the words of John Black that is saving so much money. The same guy who is cashing the $40 million check right. based on this Premier's <laughs> recession. Mr. Speaker, it's not just the nurses, it's not just the union of nurses that's raising concerns, and that ought to be enough for this Premier and this government to pay attention. But it's the Health Quality Council's own data, Mr. Speaker, that shows that this Premier's and this government's lean obsession is not working. The HQC's own data shows that adverse events are up, the mortality rate is up, the infection rate is up, and patient satisfaction is down. My question to the Premier, how can he dismiss his government's very own data? Here, here. Most people in Saskatoon and throughout the province cannot understand why Saskatoon City Hospital is not used for the purpose for which it was built. I think it's probably safe to say that it was, it's never been properly utilized. But this government, Mr. Speaker, has made the situation much worse, much worse by actually closing City Hospital for acute care since 2008. This government turned City Hospital into a health facility that performs day procedures, provi provides outpatient services, and houses people waiting for long-term care. Anyone that shows up at City Hospital or ER during its reduced hours and needs to be admitted for acute care is transferred by ambulance to St. Paul's or RUH. This defies common sense, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, how can this government, how can they defend the increasing underutilization of Saskatoon City Hospital under its watch? Dr. Nawal Sharma has spoken out publicly about this and expressed his frustration. He says, quote, most physicians and nurses think the standard of acute care in Saskatoon hospitals has steadily declined in recent years. This isn't for the lack of effort by doctors, nurses, and other care providers, but because of the lack of space and resources. He goes on, quote, it's an unfortunate state of affairs that city, the best built state of the art acute care facility is closed for the purpose it was built, end quote. Since writing that, paper, that uh, letter to the paper, Mr. Speaker, Dr. Sharma has met with senior health region administrators and he's identified at least 64 beds in rooms that were designed for acute care but are being used for administration offices or other purposes. My question to the Premier, how can he justify health care administration being so bloated that we have whole wings intended for acute patient care being used for offices and other purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, the government announced on April 3rd that it would close public liquor stores in Ituna, Langenberg, Pontex and Corrobert. Many are concerned about the loss of jobs and the impact that loss will have on these rural communities. The Ituna Business Association wrote to the Minister and said, quote, as the local business association, it was very disheartening to hear that a business in our town would be closing and we hope that you will reconsider this decision, end quote. Mr. Speaker, today we're joined by many in our province who support these thriving public liquor stores. The application for franchises closes today. It's not too late. Will the minister listen to the Business Association? Will she reverse her decision to close these liquor stores? Mr. Speaker, we know that the Minister of Social Services went to Ghana and London and there were many inappropriate expenses that were billed part of that trip. And we know that the Minister took her very close friend along on that trip. They had a $200 personal lunch and paid for by taxpayers, which was only repaid once it was exposed. They were chauffeured around in a Mercedes at a cost of $3,600, which again was only repaid once we exposed it. And we know that the Minister of Social Services appointed the same friend as the co-chair of the Social Services Appeal Board, which is supposed to be supposed to be an independent tribunal. But the minister and her, and her friend have been chatting it up inappropriately. And that's something that the Premier said yesterday would not be appropriate. Again, my question to the Premier, why isn't this being taken seriously? The taxpayers actually paid for a one and a half hour discussion between the Minister of Social Services and her very close friend that she appointed to the board. And the topic of the discussion was about issues related to the appeal board. The Premier said yesterday that such discussions would not 
be appropriate. We've talked to others who are well acquainted with the Social Services Appeal Board who all agree that this interaction is completely unacceptable. At best, Mr. Speaker, at best, it contributes to the appearance of interference with an independent tribunal. My question, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, how on earth can he justify this after learning about the details of the contact between the Minister and her very close friend? Recognize the Minister of Social Services.